Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Eric, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Eric. And it's been by uh, the grace of God, sponsorship, and action in AA. I've been sober since December 12th of 87. And uh, really appreciate being asked to be here tonight. At uh, you know, as we always hear, it's and it abs- it's absolutely true for me. It's an honor to speak in an A meeting, and it's certainly very contrary to uh, to my nature, uh, or at least before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was terrified of uh, of you finding out what I was really like, and certainly wouldn't want to put myself in a position where you might be able to see how crazy I really was, and I uh, was terrified of that. So. You know, being behind a podium is certainly something that I uh, would not have been able to do uh, if it weren't for an, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. The flip side of that, though, and to add a little bit to what Mike said, uh, it was a three-and-a-half-hour drive, but but the fact is I would drive great distance today to hear the sound of my own voice. Uh, <laughs> you know, I uh, I usually enjoy what I have to say, and I'm enamored with, uh, what, I, with what, I'm, what I'm saying. So, you know, it, it, it's funny. I... Uh, I'm not kidding. Uh, but really, uh, this, this is a group that, uh, like Bobby said, you know, it's much like our group and uh, has the same name. But it's also, uh, you know, there's a passion here for Alcoholics Anonymous. And that passion is rooted in, you know, an absolute necessity to surrender. And I think, uh, you know, you can sum that up pure, purely in the ethic of sponsorship. You know, the fact that there's some structure here and there's a plan of action. You know, it's very clear what you guys do. Uh, there's no mystery to that. There's no guesswork needed. You you simply can fall in line and, and do what we do, and you'll be all right. And, you know, that's what I need. And I desperately need that kind of uh, structure in my life today. You know, and it, and it doesn't matter how long you've been involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. You you still need that if you're, if you're an alcoholic like I am. You know, I absolutely need to, to have a home and to have a place where, you know, I can plug in and I can be a part of. And, and you know... Uh, it's it's somewhat challenging, if, you know, a little bit for me, only because uh, in my group I got the most sobriety, and uh, you know, so you're you're uh, you know, we can be leaders in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I think everybody's got a shot at being a leader in Alcoholics Anonymous. You just have to stay long enough. Uh, but you know, it's nice to uh, come down, and, and Mike has more time than me, so I can, you know, I can uh, I can check to Mike. And he kind of he kind of checked me at dinner anyway a couple times, so you know I deserve that, and you know and I I need that, and we all need that. We need to be uh, sometimes know where we are, and it's uh, it's important for me to have people that are on the path in front of me, you know, people that have you know continued to many times just trudge, because you know my emotions and my sincerity level hasn't always matched my actions. Sometimes I'm just doing the deal, and uh, that kind of ebbs and flows for me. I, I know many people that's the case in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know we kind of ebb and flow sometimes. Uh, that's true even in my prayer life today. I, sometimes I'm just not totally sincere and I'm going through the actions, but that's okay. And uh, so anyway, I'm kind of putting the cart before the horse a little bit. My, my story is actually fairly pathetic. Uh, I'm better off if I stay sober because I'm always impressed with these guys, you know, Rob Banks and, you know, escaped insane asylums and uh, there's a few nods here, but, uh, you know, my drinking is kind of pathetic. I'm, I'm a whiner by nature. Uh, you know, I'm pretty much a, a guy that just likes to think a lot and, you know, sit at home and, and analyze stuff. And, and uh, it's just not exciting. It doesn't make for good, you know, story material. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of a pathetic drunk. I, uh, I grew up in a little town in Wisconsin. Uh, and I, I could tell Larry was from up in that area when he talked. And, and I, I talk funny like that too, I guess. Uh, you know, it was a very small town, and, and you know, my mindset uh, for a long time was that everybody there drank, and, and that was kind of why I drank. You know, it was my environment. It was uh, well, just what we did, and, and I've gone back since. That's, you know, not totally true. There, there's plenty of people there that don't drink, that le- seem to be living fairly normal, comfortable lives. A good friend of mine that I grew up with, uh, which I always thought he kind of drank like I did. He doesn't drink anymore. He's coach of the high school football team and seems to be doing very well. That would not have been the path I would have taken. Uh, I was uh, I was 21 when I got sober, and uh, I certainly was uh, positioned to die. Basically, I mean, I just wasn't going very well, and I'll, I guess I'll get into that in a little more detail. But uh, 
but I grew up in a small town and, uh, you know, my, uh, my first experiences with drinking were is kind of incidental. I mean, I didn't really set out to be an alcoholic or think about that. I didn't really think about that at all. It was just purely what guys did. Uh, you know, they were, they were going out and, you know, vandalizing or doing graffiti. I would have done that too and did that too. And one night it was just, uh, they drank. And so I drank with them and, uh, really gave it no thought and, uh, didn't really seem to have much of an effect. I didn't drink that much, but, but I can tell you the first time I, I got drunk, uh, I remember that vividly. It was a snowy night in Friendship, Wisconsin, the town I grew up in. And it was one of those nights where you probably don't have them a lot down in Dallas, but, uh, we're, uh, you know, it's kind of an orange tint to the sky and the snow is just kind of falling lightly and it's, uh, very still and very calm. It's very, very beautiful. And there was this guy that was a couple of years older than me that had a bottle of Catherine the Great vodka. And, uh, yeah, you know, three ninety nine a quart or whatever the heck it is. And, uh, and we had, he had two olive green, uh, coffee cups and we pre- proceeded to kind of walk around the snowy streets of friendship, Wisconsin, drinking, you know, this Catherine, the great vodka. And I remember, uh, you know, feeling, uh, wonderful. In fact, he told me that I said the next day, he told me, I, I kept saying over and over, this is phenomenal. And I don't remember saying that, but I, I remember it feeling that way. And I ended up that night passing out in a snowbank outside of a gas station. Uh, from that, we uh, busted in on a dance at the VFW, and I'm cutting the rug with some old ladies. And uh, <laughs> vague recollection of that. That's certainly not in my nature. And then I ended up passing out on in the basement, uh, uh, his unfinished basement where, he, where at his house, and uh, had fallen and smashed my head. And uh, so when I woke up, you know, I was kind of stuck to the to the cement floor and, and, uh, it was a, you know, not a good first drunk. I mean, the, the consequences weren't tremendous or anything, but it was, you know, it was a lot for being, you know, 14 years old. And that next day, my family was to have gone down to see the Nutcracker play Christmas time. And, and I kind of blew that and ruined that family event. And, uh, so those were the consequences. I was deathly ill and I got in trouble. But in spite of that, like you hear over and over is I knew instinctively that I was going to do that again. You know, there was, wasn't much question in my mind whether or not I was going to do that again. Obviously needed to work on, you know, some of the details, but I was going to drink more and I proceeded to drink more. And, you know, I'll add a little bit of color to my, to my drinking, but I, but I can sum it up pretty much like this, you know, because I got sober fairly young. The more I drank, the harder it was for me to be sober. You know, my very nature sober, even before I drank, was that I was generally just very uncomfortable. I was very concerned about what you thought of me because I just assumed that you were thinking of me. I was very on edge. And, you know, they used to, you know, call that self-conscious, you know, that, oh, Eric's very self-conscious, which is just self-centeredness. We, you know, that's what we call it in AA. They called it shy and, you know, self-conscious. But I was. I was just always consumed with me and, uh, you know, always thinking about me and, and very uncomfortable most of the time. And I would... uh put on airs, you know, that I, you know, such that I could do well in school to a degree. And uh, I even was, was class president one year and I, you know, participated in sports and those kind of things. But, but, you know, inside I was just kind of a screaming maniac. I mean, I just was very scared and, and very afraid that you would find out what I was really like. And, uh, and once you found that out, I, I thought you would certainly want nothing to do with me and just felt awkward and geeky. And I, and I had things to support that. I mean, I was kind of awkward and geeky. I always, uh, you know, was kind of small for my, uh, I was going to say small for my size. That doesn't really make sense. Small, <laughs> small for my age. And, uh, you know, I had buck teeth and, and, you know, pimples intermixed with freckles. And I just, I felt kind of geeky and was a little geeky, but, uh, you know, I just was constantly thinking of me. And, and so drinking for me, uh, was a, was a huge solution to that. You know, like it is for a lot of us, man, I'm, you know, when I'm sober, I'm just, I'm nuts. I mean, I'm just uncomfortable. And when I drink, that goes away, you know, that, and and more than that, it's almost like my life begins, you know, the door opens and I can float through the room and I can interact with you. I can talk to you comfortably. Uh, I was always very afraid of, uh, particularly of women. And, you know, when I was drunk, I, I wasn't as afraid of women. I could talk to women. And, uh, you know, problem though was that, you know, usually 
I would drink so fast, typically, that I would kind of blow past the mark where I made any sense. So when I was talking to the women, I was kind of blabbering and, you know, um, I wasn't very effective, I guess would, <laughs> would be the way to say that. And, uh, you know, and again, I, I, just to summarize to some degree, you know, I just, I was crazy sober and, uh, you know, I went from being somewhat, uh, well, you know, successful as you can be in school at that age to flunking out of high school. Uh, you know, when I was 17, I, I had basically accumulated enough F's that you know, I wasn't going to graduate. And, uh, and I was also kicked out of the house when I was 17 because my parents just really had no idea what to do with me. Uh, you know, when I was coming home at, you know, six in the morning or the next day sometime, uh, after time, after time, after time, several ultimatums, if you keep this up, you know, Eric, you're going to be kicked out. Uh, I eventually was. And at the time, I was really, you know, pretty irritated about that. I mean, I really felt like they didn't understand me and uh, what was, you know, I, I really blamed them for my lot in life. Uh, what I wanted everybody else to think, though, was that I that I was kind of living a, a, a free life, you know, that I was doing what I wanted to do. I, I really was a worshiper of uh, Jim Morrison. I, I read his biography, or at least the first couple chapters, and... Uh, I just, I, I wanted to be like that. You know, I wanted, more than anything, I wanted you to think I was like that. And so when I was kicked out of, of school and kicked out of the house, I lived in the 73 Dodge Dart and in a town of 2,000 people. I mean, everybody kind of knows what you're doing. And, but I wanted you to all to think I was kind of, you know, living on the edge and, you know, and, and wanted to be like Jim Morrison, you know, and I kind of dressed like that and, which is hard to pull off when you look more like Howdy Doody. But, uh, you know, I really wanted you to think that. And uh, I, I just, you know, I just was kind of just goofy crazy. And and what happened was is the people that I would have associated with before I stopped hanging with. You know, you, you begin to seek out, you know, lower companions. And I, I did. I mean, the people I started hanging with were guys that weren't going to high school that were, you know, getting in trouble and, you know, working at the paper paper mill and just kind of, you know, just carousing. And that's, you know, that's what I was doing. And um, a lot of the areas of my life begin to fall apart. Uh, you know, I, Chuck C. always talks about the departments of his life and how he's an absolute failure in every one. And I, I always appreciated him saying that because as I looked at my life, I was a failure in every one. My departments were different because I was, you know, 18, 17 years old, but uh, I was losing I wasn't on the road to corporate success like I had fancied I would be someday. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I always kind of had this idea that I, I would be president, you know. I think it's amazing how many alcoholic men think they thought they were going to be president. I don't know what it is. I mean, we our egos are, are such that we just really believe some of those things. Uh, it's hard to do when you're living in a 73 Dodge Dart. It's hard to get a campaign going, you know. You're, <laughs> you're, uh, it's very grassroots at that point. But uh, I... I really struggled with that. You know, I, I, as much as I wanted you to think that I was uh, something that I wasn't, and a lot of the time I would believe that myself, uh, you know, the, the difficulty is, is at 2 in the morning when you're sitting in your car and you've, you know, parked for the night, uh, you begin to have these conversations with yourself. And, and, and I'm sure you can relate if you're an alcoholic like I am. There were times where I had drunk, drank, as much as I was capable of drinking, you know, maybe I had run out of money or run out of time. I was physically drunk, but I was still thinking. You know, it wasn't the the laughing, you know, hilarious, let's go get them craziness. It was just kind of solemn, drunken thinking. And, uh, and those were miserable times for me. I would get very extremely depressed. And I would think about all the you know, crappy stuff I, I had done. And uh, and one of the things that used to haunt me a lot was I had a little brother that was uh, eight years younger than me. And, uh, and he's, he's my only brother. And a lot of the times my parents would go out of town and they would leave me to take care of him. And uh, my plan for that was typically to lock him in his room for the weekend. And, uh, I mean, literally lock him in his room for the weekend, okay? 
and he would bang on the door if he had to, you know, use the restroom or whatever and let him out. And if he mouthed off, I'd throw him back in there. And, you know, and I just was, I just was out of control. And I'm sure for, you know, an eight, nine year old kid, it was pure terror. You know, sometimes he would be able to kind of work his way out with some kind of tool or whatever on the door and he'd come out and then he'd be exposed to just, just pure, you know, unadulterated alcoholism in many forms. And, uh, you know, I remember times I'd kind of come to and he'd be sitting in front of the TV eating cornflakes watching cartoons and there'd be people, you know, after bar crowd passed out in our living room. I mean, I just exposed him to some stuff that, you know, I feel terrible about. And I, uh, I mean, he's my brother, but, uh, you know, I hear people talk about, you know, exposing their children to those type of things. And man, I just, my heart just sinks when I hear that stuff because I, it, may, it just reminds me of, of what I put my brother through. And, uh, and I, you know, anything could have happened to the kid. I, you know, had no idea. And so we had a very fragmented relationship for a long time. And those were the things I would think about at two in the morning and what a loser I was. You know, how many times would he come in, bust into my room, and here I was, you know, dealing drugs or, you know, doing something like that or, you know, just stuff that he shouldn't have been seeing. And uh, so you think about that stuff, you know, the, the, the coolness and the act that you want to put on just kind of falls away. And the reality of your own alcoholism hits you hard and you have those conversations. And a lot of times I would entertain those thoughts of, man, I should just I should just check out. You know, this is, you know, what am I doing? I just get that kind of morose and that depressed. And uh, the last year of my drinking was really just a lot of that kind of depressing, you know, stuff. That pattern continued. And, and I would try to quit, and I wouldn't be able to quit. And, um, you know, and I had a lot of these deals where if you want to come back for Thanksgiving, you got to go talk to this counselor kind of stuff, and which was always an opportunity for me to stock up so I would, you know, on food or whatever. So I would go to those counselors and most of the time I would just, you know, play along and, and, you know, do whatever. I really never took any of that seriously, although there were a lot of good intention people trying to help me. And, um, but I, I never really, I never really saw value in what these people were telling me because I knew they really didn't understand what it was like to be where I was. You know, uh, most of us is, most of, most alcoholics uh, absolutely think nobody understands our case. You know that is that is one of the things we suffer from is that, and it's one of the things we all have in common is that we think we're so damn unique that nobody can really understand us. You just you really don't know, and that's what I felt when I was talking to these people, whether they were counselors or people in churches or whatever, principals or you know police. Um, I also had kind of a shoplifting problem, and and I got in trouble a lot for 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 stealing stuff from stores. Shoplifting, they call that. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I was getting in trouble, seeing a lot of people have a lot of ultimatums and, uh, and none of that was sinking in. None of that was sinking in. Uh, I, when I was 18, when I was 18, I, uh, looked up my real father and, uh, I thought maybe that would kind of spark me back to something. And I hadn't seen him since I was two. So, you know, I'm sure he was anxious to see me 18. And uh, and I created some kind of story or whatever that I needed to see him and something, basically just to get in and have a place to stay. And man, I just you know whole new setting, and I just totally terrorized that family. I mean, he had a a wife, uh, a daughter, you know that it, they, none of them had ever really known me. And uh, and I just tore that family apart and st- uh, you know lied and stole stuff from them and smashed stuff up and you know, got in a car accident in their neighborhood and. Uh, uh, one time there was a party for this girl at a country club, and I, you know, I was kind of half in a blackout, and I walked into the bathroom, and uh, and I kind of, I remember part of this. I, I just started karate kicking the walls in. I just, I don't know why, I just started kicking all the walls into this bathroom. And I came out, and, you know, the father of this daughter at this country club that it was having this party, you know, was like, man, wh- what happened in the bathroom? Somebody just terrorized the bathroom. You know, who did that? And I looked on and I got plaster on my shoes. I'm like, man, I did that, you know, and I got to, I got to go, you know, and, and another time I just, you know, I was coming home and, and staying with these people and, uh, and I, and I kind of drove over all the, it was garbage day. Everybody had their garbage out in this suburban neighborhood. And, and I just kind of half on the road, half on the lawn, you know, for a couple blocks. And, you know, and I, it's like, I don't know why I did that stuff. I would. You know, it, was, it would get to where I would be so drunk, I'd just be kind of in a blind rage, you know, and 
and which is dangerous. When you're five seven, you get beat up a lot. Is what happens. And I got beat up a lot. I mean, I'm just not a good fighter, you know. And and you, you know, I get mouthy and I get I get angry. And uh, so you know, things weren't going well. And I, I terrorized that family, and I felt terrible about that. It lasted like four or five months, and then I, you know, headed back to Wisconsin from Chicago. And you know, and I'm I'm trying to do something to spark me back. And I moved in with this. Uh, this hippie house, it was a co-op in Madison, Wisconsin, right on the campus. And it was a lot of, you know, early 80s, a lot of kind of hippie wannabes. And, and so I, you know, bought some tie-dyes and, you know, I had kind of long hair anyway and some sweaters and stuff and talked about dead shows that I'd never been to and just to try to fit in, you know. And and the problem with a co-op is, is you're, it's kind of a, uh, well, it's a co-op. You're supposed to help each other. And, you know, I'm stealing their tofu and, you know. <laughs> Just, you know, and their other stuff. And and they asked me to leave. And, you know, one of the other things I was doing is, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people in the hippie drug scene don't really take well to alcoholics. I mean, I'm sitting on the front steps with some of the local, you know, street people drinking, you know, Wild Rose and walking down to the Antelope, you know, liquor store to, you know, buy a bottle for, you know, everybody chips in a buck and then we take turns swigging. You know, that was my social circle. Those are the people that I felt comfortable drinking with, and the hippies just didn't want that kind of riffraff on their front porch. Uh, so they asked me to leave, and, uh, you know, and I, I, I kind of went from that to, uh, you know, the idea that I needed to work. I just need to work. I need to get a job, and I need to work. And, you know, I think a lot of us have, have had that idea, you know, particularly when you're in that stage of your life anyway. You know, I'm going to be a man. I need to get a job. And so I became a mason's tender, which is, you're the guy that carries the bricks to the bricklayers is basically what that means. And, um, you know, and I did that. And the problem with being, uh, on the construction site is, man, I just, you know, I am so crazy that I'm, I'm like busting out in tears half the time. And, you know, and these guys would stay, say stuff to me that would offend me. And I'd, I just start crying, you know, and I'm, I just, you know, I wasn't fitting in with, you know, but I had cut my hair, bought the, you know, flannel shirts and all that stuff. But I just, I wasn't cutting the construction scene either. And, uh, and I'm like, and I, I've heard so many good speakers talk about that, you know, our nature of being a chameleon, wanting to fit in and wanting to, you know, be like the people around you, you know, so they don't figure you out so you can kind of fit in. And I did a lot of that. And I, I, I was really a, a shell of a person. You know, I, I really had no depth and no soul at all. I was, I was whatever I thought you wanted me to be. And, uh, which might qualify me for Al-Anon a little bit. I don't know. I mean, cause I, I've heard a lot of Al-Anons talk about that. You know, I mean, that, that, you know, that kind of a deal. I mean, I've heard other alcoholics say they didn't care about those kind of things. They just liked to drink. But it seemed like my nature was to always be consumed with me and thinking what you thought about me. And, uh, so. You know, anyway, what, what I had done at about 1920, I, uh, these periods of depression were getting a little bit more severe, um, such that I was now willing to maybe try to find something that could spark me back. And I, I started going to some counselors on my own accord and, um, somewhat because my parents wanted me to, but I, I was looking for answers at this point and, uh, suspected that I may have a problem. Um, and I was I was going to these counselors, and I was also going to a lot of churches. Uh, I, I had kind of a vague notion that, you know, God was an answer. I don't know where I got that, probably from going to church when I was a kid, I guess. But I had that in the back of my mind. The thing that always happened for me, though, is when I, when I would go to the uh, churches, and I went to a lot of different kinds of churches, is I just felt very, uh, very dirty and very, you know, unclean and, and uh, couldn't fit in there. I... And, and the people were great. People would, you know, hey, we're going to go play volleyball or we're going to get together and, you know, study the Bible. You want to come? And, and I just, I couldn't bring myself to do that. I was just too terrified of that. And I, I just felt like those people really didn't understand me. And, 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 uh, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do that. You know, that wasn't for me. I was too separate from those, those good intentioned people. And so church didn't, didn't seem to be an answer for me. And, uh, and I also was very critical and very cynical when I heard people talk about, you know, passing the basket because we needed to build a new annex onto the church. I just, I just would write that off as well. It's just about the money or, you know, I mean, or I, you know, I, I would think about the Catholic 
religion, which I was kind of raised in, and how the you know the Pope in the 14th century had a girlfriend, and so it's it's you know it's crap. I know it's you know, and I just would I'd come up with some crazy notion of why you know uh, to excuse myself from that, and I never really could find an answer. You know, all these places that I was looking, there's one real common denominator though, is that I was looking for the answer still within me. I was counting on me to look to figure it out, to learn some piece of information so I could apply that to my life and fix me. And I really hadn't surrendered yet. And, uh, you know, what what uh, what ultimately happened is, is I, I just got very suicidal and I got very, uh, very depressed and very crazy. And I got to where I was basically, uh, I had moved into a vacated apartment and uh, kind of on the sly and was living in this place with no electricity or anything, shades drawn, um, just really in, in, in fear and in terror most of the time that I would be found out, which makes sense. I mean, if you're living in a vacated apartment, you know, you should be afraid that they're going to come and find out that you're living there. Uh, you know, no mystery, but that's, that's what was going on. And, and that coupled with just all the other craziness, it was just an awful depressing time. And I was seeing this one counselor, you know, uh, which she suggested that I go to AA. And she just simply said, you know, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I've been sober a year. And uh, I go to AA. Maybe you should try going to AA. Sounds like you have a problem with drinking. And I went. I went because she said that. And she talked about how she would be drinking and have her cars, uh, kids in the back seat as she was going to the grocery store. And I thought, you know, for her to tell me that was kind of amazing. I can't believe she shared that with me. And, uh, and so I went to A, and I went in part because this woman was attractive too, and I didn't have a lot going on. Uh, you know, she was listening to me for whatever thirty dollars an hour or whatever it was, but she was listening to me, and I, I was—I uh, just didn't have much going on. I was pretty pathetic that way. I, I, I mean, I went for six years with. Uh, well, I don't have to say that, I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, just you know, I just that wasn't happening for me. I didn't, I didn't have. Uh, I just, that, my drinking didn't allow for that. You know, my, my self-centered fear didn't allow for that. So, so anyway, I was infatuated with this counselor. I went to A and Park to find her. And I didn't find her. Uh, I found a bunch of old men, you know, that, um, made me feel welcome, but I, but I certainly didn't at first glance want what they had. Uh, I was 21 years old and, and they just seemed to be kind of at the end of the rope. You know, they were, uh, maybe 40, 50, but they just, they, I mean, I was not where they were at at all. It was a little town in Wisconsin and they, the meeting was in the basement of the town hall, you know, swing, one swing light bulb kind of thing. And, uh, it was just dark and kind of depressing and the smoke and the coffee. And I just, I just, you know, wasn't that excited about it, but, uh, the guys there made me feel welcome. And they said, come back. My first meeting was on a Wednesday and they said, come back. So I came back and, uh, you know, my first six months of being sober is, is really kind of a blur. You know, I know that at about six months, I kind of just realized I had not drank for six months. I mean, that doesn't sound very exciting, but that's really what it was. It was almost like, wow, you know, I hadn't drank for six months by going to these meetings religiously. And that was really my experience. And I'm sure there was a lot going on. I mean, I'm sure I was crazy and, you know, goofy and all that, which I know I was. But I but I don't remember much of it. I just remember going to meetings over and over and over. I wasn't working. I had no other place to go. So I went to a lot of meetings. And uh, between six and eight months, uh, I remember this, though, vividly, I started getting the idea that, you know, AA wasn't working. Uh, it was like, you know, I would go to these meetings and it would be okay for an hour but after that hour, I was leaving the meeting, and I was now much very conscious of the fact that I was absolutely stark raving crazy. And I was feeling more depressed and more suicidal between meetings than I was between drunks. You know, at eight months sober, I was just absolutely out of my mind, and I didn't know why, because I was going to these meetings, but I was just insane. And, and about that time, there was this guy that had, had seen me in some meetings and tried to talk to me uh, after meetings before, and he stopped me one day. He, he stood physically in front of the door, and uh, on this occasion, he said, Eric, he said, look, he said, your problem is is that you're a selfish little SOB, and unless you ask for help, you're probably going to leave here. And if you do, you may not come back. You know, you come to these meetings, and you, you know, put a few slogans together, and you blurb out some stuff that you don't even know what you're saying, and that's not going to cut it anymore. You know, you need to get an Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And I thought two things when he said that to me. I thought, you know, well, who the heck are you? You know, I mean, you're not supposed to take people's inventories in AA. You know, that's that's the kind of stuff I pick up on. And uh, but the other thing I thought was, how does he absolutely know that? I mean, how is he able to cut right through and and describe me to a T? And uh, I, I I hated this guy. But I ended up asking him to sponsor me. You know, short short story. Uh, I said, all right, fine, Marty. What am I supposed to do? You know, fine. What am I supposed to do? And that being a question that was probably the most important question I'd ever ask. He sat me down and he, he wrote out six things for me to do, which weren't none of them were in the big book. I mean, they were weird things, which I would, wouldn't recommend to anybody else. But, but at the time, I was willing to do anything. He could have said, stand on one leg in front of a mirror, naked, whistling Dixie, and I would have done that. You know, I would have done whatever. He said, okay, fine. I, I had surrendered. I had given up. And I'd reached that point that I think anybody that stays in Alcoholics Anonymous and is active in AA uh, gets to. And that's the point where you just turn in, you know, throw in the towel, and you're done. You give up. That's what I did with Marty. And Marty Marty had me do stuff. You know, he got me involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. Marty was crazy. Marty didn't have a sponsor himself. But he was all that there was there. And I did what he did. Uh, he was uh, he was a guy that would ride around on his motorcycle with a bandana and, uh, you know, long hair. And he was just a scary, imposing, large man. He had done two tours in Vietnam. It actually said that on the side of his motorcycle. And he was just a scary guy. But when Marty talked, you knew that he had been where you had been. And Marty saved my life. You know, Marty was, was the best example of Alcoholics Anonymous that I had then. And uh, Marty sponsored a bunch of guys, and we, we all followed him around. They called us Marty's Disciples. We walked around with our big book like it was a shield, and we'd invade mating, uh, meetings and, you know, try to take it over. And uh, it was just kind of crazy, but a lot of fun. And and uh, Friday nights we had a fish fry, and we'd all go out for fish fry after the meeting. And Marty had to start a meeting at the state mental hospital there. And uh, we just, you know, one of the things he said you absolutely need to do is you need to make these other guys your best friends. And I had absolutely nothing in common with these guys. There was... Uh, one of these guys drove the city bus in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Bill, one of the guys, had uh, sold used restaurant equipment. One guy was on work release, so he could just come to the meetings and then, you know, come visit with us on weekends. Uh, one guy repaired computers. Uh, it was just, and you know, I'm a flunk out loser, you know, hippie construction worker wannabe, and we just hung together. I mean, we did everything together. We'd go shopping together. We'd do laundry together. We'd go to the movies together. And I, I just did everything with these guys. And, and it, was, it, was, it was an amazing time. It was an amazing time. And, uh, and you know, in about two and a half years after doing that, you know, Marty said, hey, you know, I want you to, uh, I want you to go to school. And, I, you know, Marty, I flunked out of high school. And he said, I want you to go to school. And the, how you're going to do that is you're going to get a tutor for every class. And so I was able to take some classes and get into the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and I'd even tried a couple years prior in a drunken stupor and flunked out in a semester. I mean, I had like a .73. So uh, I was not a good student. Marty said, you're going to get a tutor for every class, and you're going to study, and you're going to here's your schedule. You're going to make out a schedule. And I did that. And, I, you know, Marty had never been to college, but he, he helped me apply the principles of A into going to school. And I ended up going to the University of Wisconsin and getting a degree and I studied Chinese, of all things. I learned how to speak Chinese. You know, I don't know why. Uh, I think, honestly, the truth was is I thought if I went to China, I wouldn't be the shortest guy around or something. I, <laughs> I, I'm not kidding either. I, I really think that was part. So I learned to speak Chinese. And, I, uh, in fact, I was, uh, I was living with these guys from China for, for, for a year or two as I was going to school. And uh, we'd have A meetings and some, we'd have Chinese people there. And it was just it was a crazy, weird time. And, and, uh, you know, they were coming to our open meetings, and it was, it was just bizarre. But, uh, you know, I was just, I just was in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, about the time that I graduated, Marty, Marty kind of split. Marty was one of these guys, and I've seen guys like him. They're kind of these lone wolf AAs. They're very charismatic, uh, can really reach out to the newcomer, but they have absolutely no structure or accountability in their life. And they drift, and they go from meeting to meeting, and they, they, uh, and that's what Marty did. Marty left. Marty actually left the state. And here I was, you know, 
few years sober with no sponsor. And uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I went that way for about six months. And I was just absolutely out of my mind, insane, not knowing what I was going to do. Here I was, you know, graduated school and, uh, you know, no sponsor. I'm still going to meetings, but I just, I don't know what, you know, it was just one of those points where you just, you're almost starting over. I didn't know what to do. And the guy that's, uh, had re- repaired computers that Marty sponsored and moved out to Nebraska. And, uh, you know, I called Steve up and I said, Steve, I, I don't know what to do, man. I'm, I'm struggling. Marty's, Marty left and yeah, you know, he knew and he said, why don't you come on out here? You know, we got a deal and uh, out here called the Cornhusker Roundup. And I'll tell you, Eric, you know, he's told me since I've been out here, it's just been amazing. I've, I've seen AA in a whole new way and you, know, you ought to come out. <laughs> so I got some guys that I sponsored and we, we drove out to the Cornhusker Roundup in 1990 in, uh, in Omaha. And, and it just blew me away. It just absolutely blew me away. It was it was 4,000 people there that year. And it was, uh, you know, I'd always heard these speaker tapes back in this little town in Wisconsin, you know. And, and I'd hear these great speakers. But I, I never saw AA like that anywhere, you know. I mean, I, I'd hear it in tape land, but I never really saw it real live, you know. And here I was, and I remember Hank Johnson was one of the speakers. And I just always loved Hank Johnson. He was a, one of my favorite speakers, and he was speaking and and I just, I mean, I was, it was like going to a rock concert. It was just, man, that's Hank Johnson live, you know, and it was incredible. And, uh, and I just, I went up to him and I remember, you know, man, Mr. Johnson, I just, we listened to your tape on the way from Wisconsin and wow, it's so cool to see you. And, you know, he pulls you through the line and he didn't really care, but, uh, it was just exciting. And, you know, and I ended up asking Steve to sponsor me. And a few months later, I had an opportunity to go to graduate school and uh, got accepted to a program in Nebraska and uh, and moved out to Lincoln, Nebraska. And, you know, I, I just fell in love with AA all over again. The thing that I was missing was this whole ethic of sponsorship. You know, you can stay sober, you know, reading the big book every day and, and you know, being an AA expert and going to the meetings and just da 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 you know. But, man, I just I wasn't plugged into anything. I had no accountability, and I had no peers, and I had no sponsorship chain, and and I got that in Nebraska, and I just I was plugged in, and I was on fire with it, and I just I fell in love with AA there, uh, and uh, we had a a great young group up there in, in Lincoln, it was about 150 people, it was a vibrant young group, reminds me a lot of the Phoenix group in Norman, everybody was dating each other, and it was just crazy, and uh, and I it's like the 90210 of AA, you know, and. Uh, and, and I met my wife there, and uh, she was a newcomer. She was 10 months sober uh, when I finally asked her out. But I remember when she first came to the meeting, she walked right into a wall with a cup of coffee and knocked her right over, and coffee spilled, and she was looking the other way. And, you know, it was, I just, wow, yeah, that's that's the one, you know. And, and uh, I knew she would, you know. And so our ethic up there was you got to wait a year before you mess with the newcomer. Know, but at 10 months, I asked her sponsor if I could ask her out, and she said, okay. And so I asked Jeannie out, and we dated for a couple of years, and we got married. And, uh, you know, and we've, we've been married now for nine, nine and a half years, I guess. And uh, Jeannie's a great active member of Alcoholics Anonymous in, in, in Edmond. And, uh, you know, life's been really good. You know, I, I was in Nebraska and around there for about seven years, and I've been now uh, in, in, in Oklahoma for about uh, five years. And you know, is it 9.30? Is that what I got? Okay. And, uh, you know, A has just been a great experience for me. It's just, you know, I, I almost sometimes wish I had some tragic event that would be a good crying point in my talk. I really don't have that. My life's actually been fairly good. I, I've, I've been blessed. I've had a very uh, almost Cinderella-like life since I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, I ended up going to graduate school and doing well there and, and uh, got a job and uh, and uh, they sent me to China, and I was able to spend a lot of time over in China and, and representing our company. It was one of these deals where it's like, man, we got this project in China. Boy, I wish we had somebody that spoke Chinese, you know. It's, you know. And uh, they sent me over there, and I got to you know go to a lot of meetings uh, in China back in the early 90s, and, man, that was exciting. And just had some great experiences with that. And uh, and back then, they they... They were kind of clandestine. You had to like knock, you know, and they, you know, and they'd let you in. And it was no Chinese people. It was all you know foreigners that lived there, and it was just exciting and a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. And um, 
you know, I had a lot of good experiences and, and one that I'll share that really, uh, really changed my life. I, I was over there one time and, uh, and I got deathly ill. I got absolutely deathly ill and, and was cooped up in this hotel by myself for, you know, four days and just really sick. I mean, bad sick. And, uh, and I, I came to out of it kind of feeling better and I knew I needed to get something to eat. And so I was walking down to try to find some bread or something non-Chinese because the thought of that was making me nauseous. And, and I found some bread and I'm walking back uh, to the hotel down this alley. And it was one of these alleys where it was like also kind of the sewage canal type deals and this awful foul stench. And I heard this music and it was just this uh, unbelievable unbelievable music and I just didn't know where it was coming from and as I got closer to it I saw these two blind crippled old people that were sitting in this filth that were playing this music you know and it was the most beautiful music I, I mean it was unbelievable and you know I had always had this idea that if there really was a God you know why is there all this crap in the world you know, why do people die, and why is there this and all that? And I just always would think about stuff like that. And, you know, when I saw these two people there and heard this music, all I can tell you is, is it just it was like I knew God was there. I was able to see God in the face of these people. And, you know, and here's a country of, you know, one and a half billion or two billion people, whatever it is, and it's like, you know, how is God here? How is God involved in this deal? I mean, I think God's, you know, helping me find a parking spot at the meeting, you know. What about China, you know? And here I was, and it was like, you know, I just knew that God was there and that I just didn't have to worry about that stuff, you know, that my job is really just an AA, that I've just got to do what I'm supposed to do. I don't need to worry about all those big worldly issues, you know, that it's going to be okay. And that was just an amazing experience. I came back from that trip and I cried for a week. Jeannie thought I had caught some weird disease or something. I, I just was, uh, it just blew me away. And, um, you know, my life is good today. We have two little children. Uh, that's, that's a, a beautiful, wonderful thing. And, and the thing about that is, you know, it's anybody can have a kid really just about. I mean, that's not that hard, but, uh, but I've learned how to be a father in Alcoholics Anonymous and be a, be a st active participant in my family. Um, you know, that's something I never thought I'd be capable of doing. And today I can do that. And, uh, you know, and, and, and kids are just kids. You know, the thing I'm learning right now is that they're, they're really more God's kids than mine. You know, I'm, I'm more of a caretaker. You know, when I start taking ownership of them, uh, really what that's about is I'm trying to look good. You know, I get, when they act up in the grocery store, it's really more about me concerned whether or not somebody's going to think I'm a bad parent and, you know, and that's kind of some of the stuff I'm thinking about right now and looking at is, you know, they're just God's kids. I'm just supposed to take care of them. And that's a good deal. I mean, I really, I'm really blessed to have the life I have. Uh, I get to do some pretty neat stuff in my life today. And, you know, one thing I'll just share and, uh, you know, next weekend I get to fly up and see my brother and uh, we go to a Packer game every year and, um, you know, and, and we have a, we have a good relationship today. A couple months ago, I flew up and I see he, he's a musician and he had a big concert in Chicago and I got to fly up and surprise him and see him afterwards, uh, and the stage and, uh, you know, I really enjoyed that. And, uh, and about a week after that, uh, I was sitting at an IHOP with my family, with uh, Jeannie and the kids and Edmund. And I look up and here's my brother standing there. He flew down to see me and, you know, in, in my life and a little different. I mean, he's playing in a rock concert. I'm eating at an IHOP with two screaming kids, but, uh, you know, it just, it, it touched me a lot, you know, because we didn't talk for a long time. And today we get to, you know, we get to do those kind of things together. And, and I never thought I'd have that kind of relationship with him again. And, and that's been a really good thing. You know, life is good. And AA is, uh, is absolutely, uh, saved my ass. I mean, AA has given me the life I have today. A couple of things that I'll wrap up with real quickly. You know, what I do in Alcoholics Anonymous today is fundamentally the same thing that I do uh, or did when I got sober and was asked to do even by Marty. And that's that I have a home group. I have a place that I call home, you know, a place that I show up to. My home group, uh, we meet twice a week just like you guys do, and I'm there. And I'm absolutely there every every Tuesday and Sunday. Um, you know, the other thing I do is I, I sponsor guys. You know, I'm willing to be be a sponsor and have a sponsor. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and that doesn't mean I have to have all the answers. That just means I have to be willing to share my experience. And I really like what uh, what you said about experience, you know, because because of the quality and the quantity are both a function of experience. 
You know, I need to know that you've been where I've been. I need to know that you know, that you've absolutely got an answer for me. And I, I get that here. And that's what I get to share. You know, I get to share my experience. I don't share my opinion. I share what I do. You know, it's what we do. And, uh, and that's, that's what we do in Edmond. And I get to be a part of that. And, you know, so having a home group is important. And my relationship with my sponsor fundamentally is really an extension of, you know, that first fifth step I did with my first sponsor. <clears throat> you know, I have to have somebody in my life that knows absolutely everything about me. I can't have any secrets. You know, Jim knows everything about me. And that doesn't mean I call Jim every Thursday night at 930 and say, hey, Jim, you know, what color socks do I wear today? But if I got some issue going on, any kind of life-changing event or something that's troubling me or whatever, even if nothing's troubling me, I call him Thursdays at 930. And I, I've actually missed some myself. Uh, but, I, you know, I do that. I do that. I'm accountable to my sponsor. I need that. I need accountability to my sponsor. Um, you know, I, I try to be a good example at work. Uh, I try to do what I can to be, uh, you know, represent AA as best I can at at, uh, at work. And uh, in fact, was my boss called me on the way down here to wish me well speaking, and I, he knows I'm an AA. Bobby was swearing on the phone as I was talking to my boss, but uh, but he 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 knew what I was doing tonight. And uh, you know, and I I appreciate Bobby driving down with me tonight. Um, I appreciate the guys I sponsor. Obviously, are not desperate enough to come down and hear me talk tonight, but Bobby was, so I appreciate that. Uh, it's really an honor to speak here tonight. Um, you know, if you if you don't relate to what I said tonight, I know there's going to be another speaker here next week. You know, my experience is just simply this. You know, AA has helped me. AA has given me a life, and it's taught me how to live comfortably today without having to take a drink. And I'm I'm grateful for being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.